So hearing loss is one of those things that is very, very common and very, very pervasive, but a lot of people who have hearing loss don't realize they have it because it happens so gradually. And what tends to happen to people with a hearing loss is they start to withdraw from activities that they once enjoyed. So they'll stop going to parties, they'll stop going out to restaurants, they might stop hanging out with the kids of their friends or their own kids even because it's too difficult to hear them speak. Apart from the social withdrawal, there's also the fact that people with a hearing loss are more at risk for mental health issues, they're more at risk for adverse events in hospital, the older ones are even more at risk for cognitive decline than people with completely normal hearing. Hi, I'm Jo from the Department of Audiology and Speech Pathology. I grew up in Singapore and then I went to Vancouver, Canada to do my undergrad in speech sciences and linguistics. Then I came over to the University of Melbourne to do my master's in clinical audiology. I'm a PhD student here now. So while I'm doing my PhD, I'm still practicing as a clinical audiologist one or two days a week and I really, really enjoy my practice. I test the hearing of all ages, so from newborns, the youngest one I've seen was only 10 days old all the way up to very, very old people whose families have harassed them enough about the fact that they can't hear very well if they're coming in for a hearing test. Why clinical audiology? Well, it's actually a bit of a roundabout story. I initially wanted to be a speech pathologist, but after doing a whole undergrad of speech sciences and getting attached to speech pathologists in clinic, I realized I didn't really have the disposition for rehabilitation work and so when it came to the end of my undergrad degree, the only other postgrad option that was available and allowed me to use what I learned to my undergrad was audiology and there is diagnostic audiology as a stream of work, not just rehab and I discovered that I adored it so I'm really glad that I went on to do it. In my final year of undergrad, when the professor who I was working for asked me what I wanted to do after my degree, and at first I teased him a bit because he'd been working me so hard at the lab that I didn't really have time to look into anything, but then I thought, you know, I have been considering audiology because it's one of the things I can do with a speech degree that isn't speech pathology. And when I said that, he said, well, if you're going to do audiology, you've got to go to the University of Melbourne. And at first I thought he was a bit drunk because Vancouver is just about as far away from Melbourne as you can get, but the more I looked into it, the more it made sense. Melbourne has an excellent audiology program and so when I applied and they accepted me, I came over here. So my PhD is all about how kids who have never heard acoustic sound and they've only heard the environment through their cochlear implant learn a language that is so pitch dependent. You see, a cochlear implant is an amazing device. It makes the deaf hear and it consists of two components. The internal component is an electrode array of 22 electrodes and that's implanted into the inner ear by a surgeon. And the external component is a microphone that sits on the outside, takes the sound from the environment and turns it into a signal that can be expressed over that array. Once I finish my PhD, what am I going to do? Well, I'll, I know I'll never stop being a clinical audiologist because it really is wonderfully rewarding. But I think I'd like to spend a little bit more time teaching audiology as well because one of the things that you do when you teach audiology is you teach the next generation of audiologists to emphasize the person, to be good clinicians and not just good technicians. So. Because I feel so strongly about the profession, I'd like to contribute to it a little more by training up the next generation.